The Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, Senator Gosul Akpabi, has risen up to the challenge directed at him by the House of Representatives to name lawmakers who got contracts from the Niger Delta Development Commission. According to a report by Arise News Sister Outfit, this day newspaper, the minister in the document attached his response to the threat by the lower house of the National Assembly to sue him over allegations that the federal lawmakers were major contractors of the NDDC, listed four senators receiving 74 contracts from the commission between 2017 till date. The minister also accused chairman of the House Committee on NDDC, Olubumi Tunjiojo, for inserting 19 contracts worth 9 billion naira into the 2019 NDDC budget. House of Representatives Speaker Femi Bajabia Miller had last week given Akpabi a 48-hour ultimatum to name names as he alleged during his testimony before the House, of Committee, the House Committee on the NDDC. The House had quickly followed that up by signifying his readiness to head to the court to seek persecution of the Minister for Criminal Defamation. According to Mr. Akpabius Lee, Chairman of the Senate Committee on NDDC, Peter Wabushi allegedly executed 53 NDDC projects from 2017 till date. He also accused three other senators, namely uh, Matthew Wegide, James Manager, and Sam Ayao of executing a total of 21 NDDC contracts during the period under review. Can we say he has called their bluff now? Because while he responded that, oh, he did not say that, we thought things were going to rest, but the House said they were going to go ahead and sue him for criminal defamation. And voila, this happened. It was good to see that the minister is not um, intimidated by the moves uh, we saw from the House of the Reps. Uh, but news I gathered is that, you know, this is not a new reaction by Minister Akpabio. He apparently came with that letter that was read by um, Honorable Speaker Femming Bajabiamila on the floor of the House. But no one mentioned the attachment of the documents where he had mentioned names. However, for... Um, representatives or four lawmakers does not equate 60 percent of the lawmakers he referred to uh, during that hearing by the committee. And, and so you wonder what exactly is going on here. You say majority, 60 percent, you know, is gotten by you guys. He said so, by you guys. And if you don't know, you know, ask, ask the committee chairman especially. Mm -hmm. And then you go to name names and you name four names. Uh, in mathematics, four doesn't equate to 60 percent anyway. No, the minister has made it very clear in his uh, subsequent responses that he never said 60 percent mm. in relation to contracts. Mm. He said 60 percent in relation to medical issues, the percentage of NDDC engagement mm. in relation to other issues. Mm. And he was saying that, look, NDDC also attends to a lot of medical issues, and that in the context of COVID-19, most of the projects they have handled have been about 60% medical. That was a clarification he offered. Okay. But he did tell in the video that has gone viral, uh, he, he, he told uh, the uh, committee that, look, uh, many of your members are beneficiaries. Mm. He didn't, to be fair, put a percentage to that. However, uh, I think it's very interesting that, you know, what has come to light is now before the uh, public. Because as at last week, when uh, Femi Gwajabi Amila, the Honorable Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, said that he had received communication from Senator Akbabio, uh, recanting and retracting, uh, many people were disappointed. Mm. They thought that the way, you know, that letter uh, came across uh, was an act of cowardice. Mm. Because we had said on this program also that, look, the only defense that is available to the minister uh, was the defense of truth. Mm. And when we were told that he recanted, uh, many people were disappointed. And it's good to see him now. You know, uh, last week I said, oh, he practically switched off the mic mm. on the uh, basis of the information that uh, mm. we had. But now we can see that he has switched on the mic. And that the letter that is sent to the uh, Honorable Speaker of the House of Reps had an attachment. But uh, Speaker Bajabi Amila would seem to have chosen not to go why did it not he, to go beyond the covering letter? Why didn't he? Why didn't he read the attachment in the first place? Is well, that not is that a lack of transparency? Well, it's a cover up, and it raises issues of trust. If we cannot trust our representatives, yeah. if we cannot trust the speaker of the House of Representatives to speak truth to power and to be honest with Nigerians, then there is a problem there. And I hope that uh, uh, Honorable Femi Bajabi Amila uh, would. Uh, 
I think they are on recess now till mm. September. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he's on recess does not mean that he cannot offer clarifications. I think he owes Nigerians an explanation as to why he will cover up something as important as that. Uh, but of course, uh, Akpabio and uh, Cairo Ujoigbo, mm. who over the weekend we were told visited the uh, Asaba of uh, Asaba, mm. uh, Professor Edozien, mm. that when he visited uh, the monarch, that he also made similar uh, revelations mm. as a Senator Akpabio. Now, that's one leg of it, and we hope we will hear from Honorable Femi Bajabi Amela. The second leg of it is that, look, these uh, uh, senators and members of the House of Reps who have been called out, uh, some of them have responded, one or two of them. Mm. I think Tunjo Ojo and uh, one other. That had recused themselves before. Yes. And there had been talks about Senator Wabushi so, before now. In fact, Cairo Jubo did say he should step down from that in, uh, investigative I, I know all of yeah. those details. You know, they've said uh, Akpabio is confused. Uh, Akpabio doesn't know what he's talking about. No, they cannot say that. Because they've, they've now been put in the dock by Senator Akpabio and Cairo Jubo's revelations. Now, at issue here is a conflict of interest, an abuse of privilege. As lawmakers, they are not expected to uh -huh. use their positions either to part the budget, mm -hmm. as has been uh, alleged, or to put contracts, you know, uh, projects into the project, and to, uh, for them to come and claim that, well, you know, go and check with uh, the CAC, the Corporate uh, Affairs Affairs Commission, Commission. Uh, you can't trace it to us. I mean, people are not stupid. People know that you can use proxies. Mm -hmm. So if it can be established, really, that they are guilty of abuse of privilege and conflict of interest, using their positions to unlawfully enrich themselves, then there will be an issue. One man, 74 contracts. Yeah. Mm. Three persons, 21 contracts. Yeah. Mm. I mean, in an interventionist agency that is supposed to serve the people of the Niger Delta, mm. it looks dirty, it looks ugly. And the person that they have all served very badly yeah. is President Muhammad Ubari, mm. because these are all APC members. Mm. And one had expected that, you know, during the campaigns 2015, 2019, that they were going to buy into the vision mm. of the president. Mm. I think the president should take a special interest okay. in this matter. All right, we'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have uh, the trio of Rotus, Michael, and Aaron to give us updates on Africa and global business and COVID-19. Stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Our ever dependable Rotus Odiri is now here to give us Africa business update. Good morning, Rotus. Over to you. Good morning, Doctor. Uh, good morning, Adeso, and good morning, uh, Rufai. We kick off with um, the Third Mainland Bridge. Financial Derivatives Company has a, uh, a, a chart looking at the impact on um, food prices and transportation costs that the Third Mainland Bridge partial closure uh, is going to have. And um, if, you, if you look at if you get the chart up there, uh, you'll see that they estimate that there's going to be disruptions in food supply, uh, you know, of course, traffic congestion as motorists use alternative routes, spike in food prices in spite of the, the, the harvest season, reduction in the average food consumption per person because supply chains are going to be affected. The be all end all of this is that you know food prices are going to go up. A quick reminder, if we can quickly move to headline inflation, just to remind people, year on year for June, um, we're 12.56, an increase about 16 basis points from May. Let's quickly move over to this inflation chart, just looking at the movements that we've seen uh, from June 2019 up until where we are this year. It continues to rise. This is, of course, the consumer price index headline inflation. But we move to the states because primarily this is going to affect Lagosian. So if you looked at uh, inflation, yeah, interestingly enough, if you look at this uh, on the right hand side of this uh, chart from the Bureau of Statistics, they said the slowest rise in headline inflation on the right hand side, Cross River, Lagos, and Quara. I circled Lagos because, of course, that's where the Third Midland Bridge is. So that's at 10.78%. We should all take note of this number and see how it moves over the next um, six months during which the Third Midland Bridge partially closure will be taking place. If we move to the next chart, we should see um, food inflation for the states. Now, you see Lagos headline inflation was 10%. Food inflation, again, Bureau of Statistics noted that uh, in June, uh, the Lagos, Ogun, and Bauchi saw the slowest rise. Again, let us take note 
of this figure, 13.46%, since the majority, the meal impact we're going to see is on food prices. So it will be interesting to note how this figure moves um, going forward. Um, we move over to uh, still transportation, more or less. Uh, the uh, Railway Commission, uh, they sent out a tweet uh, stating that the, there it is, the, the Abuja Kaduna train service is going to resume operations as of the 29th. That's on Wednesday. They've conducted an inspection of the... In fact, they're quoting uh, the Minister of Transportation, Roti Miyamichi. They've conducted an inspection. But here's the key thing here. In the month pre-COVID, we got about 120 million in revenue. If we run at this, he's talking about half capacity. We'll realize 60 million naira. It means that we need another 60 million to complete the running cost. Because, of course, because of social distancing, uh, a number of transportation services from buses to trains had to be reduced in terms of capacity. The Minister of Transportation is admitting here that prices will have to go up to make up for the difference between half capacity for the trains and full. I think he also, if we look at his next quote here, he now talks about the increase in prices and what we're going to see for the Abuja uh, Kaduna Rail. I believe he said uh, business class is looking at, uh, first class is looking at about 6,000 Naira, uh, business class about 5,000, economy class about 3,000 Naira. So we're, we're seeing those price increases. And funny enough, uh, yeah, okay, here we go. So it is therefore above reason that the rates have been increased as follows. First class 6,000, business class 5,000, economy class 3,000. Interesting enough, I wanted to see what the current prices were, but if you go to the NRC's website, it only shows you Lagos fares from Lagos to other, other destinations. So I wanted to see what the price percentage increase was. But I, 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 I believe it's sizable. Because I think the highest price for Lagos to Kano is about 2,900 for uh, first class. But here, looking at 6,000 from Abuja to Kaduna. So sizable increase. So that's notable because last week on the Global Business Report, I was talking to uh, the MD of uh, Primero Services. The, the, they're the ones that run the BRT bus services. When the Lagos State Government, yes, there he is, Mr. Fola Tinubu, Managing Director of Primero Transport Services, along the line, he was talking about justifying the increase in bus fare because of the, not only the uh, re reduced capacity, but the general impact of COVID-19 and what it has had on the transportation sector. Him and I were going back and forth when I was telling him, look, with this bus fare increase, you know, it's going to squeeze consumer disposable income. He said, hey, we have costs, and those costs have to be met. So it is those same costs and also the revenue lines that uh, Minister of uh, Transportation, Rotimi Amichi, is referring to for trains. What about aviation? You know, you're going to have to see what happens with regards to price increase for the aviation sector. So. You, when you break all this down and you think about how much downfall, price, uh, downfall bus fare uh, has, has increased by for the everyday man and woman, this is across the board. Trains, buses, flights and everything else. It's something that we're, we're seeing become uh, very, very apparent here. Uh, we move on for, to the former uh, uh, governor of Anambra State, uh, uh, Peter Obey. I thought it was a very interesting chat that he had. He was talking about um, regretting not investing in Zoom. There it is. See, I was telling someone a few days ago, 2015, I met some people where I had gone to do a program in the US, and they told me about the Zoom business that just started. As of that time, it cost less than 30 cents to invest in Zoom, the video conferencing network, if I wanted to do so. Uh, he then says, he then talks about how he didn't believe that it was going to work. He said, they were telling me about a business proposal, and I said this will never happen, where we would be in our houses and be doing meetings. It would take some time. Here I am now in the house for four months, only to do meetings through the same thing. And if he had, just did a simple calculation, if he had bought Zoom, a thousand shares of Zoom, at 30 cents in 2015, he would have spent $300. Zoom now is at $264 a share. That's what he closed out on Friday. His uh, $300 investment would be worth $264,000 today. So, of course, there was no way he would have known back in uh, 2015 when he went for a program. Somebody just went to him and was asking for a private placement in Zoom. You just never know. And Zoom went public just last year. So I thought that was a very interesting comment there from, uh, from Peter Abbey, who is a very, he's a capital market man, always talking about investments. Finally, insurance. Um, we've got four new players that are coming into the insurance market. Nikon, the regulator, confirmed the receipt of the applications. Uh, Hairs, oh, this is Hairs Insurance Limited, of course, that's for general insurance, is of course uh, uh, run by Hairs Holdings, which is a uh, billionaire to a Lumelous company. They're going into insurance. Also, Stambic IBTC Insurance Limited, they're coming on board. These are the names of the companies when they actually do, um, you know, are vetted and allowed to come in. These are the names. So these aren't, they aren't doing business yet. This is what the names are going to be. It's going to be Stambic IBT Insurance Limited, and then here's Life Assurance Limited. So they've got general insurance, they've got uh, life assurance. And then Enterprise Life Assurance Company, that Nigeria Limited, they're actually Ghanaian. Enterprise Life Assurance is a Ghanaian firm. So once again, for our viewers, the names you are seeing are going to be the names of the insurance firms 
when they eventually come in. Insurance penetration in Nigeria is low, under between 1% and 3%. Uh, we want more players, but large players coming in who can underwrite uh, protection for, you know, especially life vehicles and so on and so forth. So it's a good thing to see more players um, coming into the space for insurance. And that's our, uh, our African business update. Uh, Rotus, uh, quickly on two issues. One, the Abuja Kaduna uh, rail line. We just hope that uh, you know the uh, target will not just be about balancing uh, earnings, revenue, you know, profit, and that uh, as the minister has promised us that uh, necessary protocols and guidelines uh, in the context of COVID-19 will be observed. The minister has said so. We expect to see that happen. But with regard to the third mainland bridge, uh, um, you know, there have been stories. I'd, I've also had personal experience. It does look to me that both the uh, Lagos State government and the federal government, they are not ready before announcing uh, a partial closure of that bridge. Yesterday was nightmarish for people coming from the uh, mainland part of Lagos uh, to uh, the island. And that was on a Sunday. Now, the... Um, Ikurudu Road, end of it, by Costain Ipmori, uh, was shut down because there was construction work going on there. And that shut down people, you know, frustrated movement for hours on end. And then also Qatar Bridge, which is the other alternative route, you know, was not available. There was also heavy traffic there. Now, if that happened on Sunday, imagine what will happen during the weekday. And I just concluded that these guys were not ready. So don't announce what you have not prepared for. The 250 uh, uh, road safety officials that they promised us, we didn't see them. The 600 uh, last mile officials that they promised were not there. The inconvenience that they said they would minimize. In, in fact, they aggravated the pain right. of uh, the people of uh, Lagos. Mm -hmm. So I hope that they will address this quickly. If they are not ready, let them suspend what they are proposing. When they are ready, they can go back to it. Okay. Great point. Great point. Well, well said there, Dr. Abati. So, so right, we'll move on to uh, business update. That's world business update with uh, Mr. Michael Wilson, joins us from London this morning. Good morning, Michael. Morning. It's very nice to uh, hear of another capital city with the kind of traffic problems that London has as well. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it, that the local authorities never actually act in concert with each other. But there we are. OK, so China first. Um, a modest recovery in Chinese shares there, but obviously gains capped with the usual tensions between the United States and China. Uh, Japanese shares dropped due to worries about those worsening ties between China and the United States exporters taking a bit of a hit because the yen is slightly firmer. Got some breaking news at the moment. I know that your COVID-19 roundup will probably carry, but countries around Asia are confronting a second wave of coronavirus infections and are clamping down again. Um, to try to contain the disease. Australia is recording a record daily rise in cases, and uh, Vietnam has locked down the city of Da Nang. So let's have a look and see what's carrying over into the week as we learned last week. We were promised a lot, really, weren't we, with the, the fiscal plan for the pandemic recovery in the EU. But as we said at the time, the reality is it's all right saying things, but how you actually disperse the money and where that money is actually going to go is the is the key to it. And, that, and this was a classic case of selling the news, actually, rather than um, anything that actually happened. So uh, with um, the, the, the and, and that really carried through to the US markets too. actually that feeling of what on earth is going on. So here at markets, we think we'll have a mildly positive start, but they will be looking at that continual promise of the one trillion, this new package, which needs to be voted. Will it be a trillion dollars? Will it be more? Will it be less? Would just don't know. But that's what we're waiting for as far as the United States is concerned. And as a result of that, US futures are a bit up um, this morning. We've also seen the dollar, the US dollar, hitting its lowest level since uh, September 2018 on, on all these kind of economic concerns. And uh, we went through the US weekly jobless figures, um, which uh, showed concerns that um, the in unemployment is increasing. This could ca well carry way through to the, the numbers this week. And the dollar is continuing to slide um, in Asia. So therefore, the corollary of all this is naturally that gold prices hit a new record high uh, in Asia today, moving beyond the previous record of wait for this $1,921 an ounce. Oil is steady. Keep an eye on the corn markets. That's my view from the commodity markets this morning. China's harvest apparently is not doing well, so you may see a rise in that. Now, 
one thing we got, the other thing that we got last week, as far as the UK and Europe's concerned, is quite a rebound, an unexpected rebound, I think, in the economies of France, Germany uh, and the UK, with improvements both in manufacturing uh, and services. And there is a thought... I'll just throw it on the table. I don't know yet because we just don't know. But there's a thought that these economies may outperform that of the United States. Um, over the weekend, a disaster for the travel industry here. Uh, UK imposed quarantine on people coming back from Spain. Uh, concerns about a second spike there. This quarantine, I'm hearing this morning, could continue to Germany and France, which would be disastrous. Ryanair is symptomatic of this. They announced a, qu a first quarter loss of 185 million euro. I'll take you very briefly through the week ahead because it's a busy one. First of all, FOMC meeting in the United States on Wednesday. No change in policy, but be very interested to hear what the central bank actually thinks about the, uh, the, cor the increase in coronavirus. US quarter two GDP as well on Thursday. That's the first uh, uh, thing we've had of that. We'll remain well short of where we were in February as far as employment's concerned. But that's a big one. Expectations for a 32.8% drop in output in Q2. Um, in the EU and also we get the German unemployment figures on the 30th. Unemployment in the EU at 7.4%. I have to say it's a surprisingly small rise given the problems we've had, and we get EU quarter two GDP on Friday. I'm always pretty sceptical about these GDP figures because they usually just a first look at what's gone on, and you have to question the detail of them and where they've actually got these figures from. Um, I have a friend who worked in the statistical office in the UK for many years, and, and he always used to say, you know, we had to rush to get these things out, and we didn't know um, how, they, how they were actually okay. Okay. going to do. Okay. Now, Okay. Okay. Yeah. Michael, real quickly, I, I want to talk about the corn market. Very important. Because I was talking to a farmer yesterday, and he said because of COVID and, you know, butter's been shot everywhere, we can't get enough corn into Nigeria. And corn is really very important because they use it in making feed for a chicken and, and the like and animals. And, and, and the farmer went ahead to say that it's even affected egg production because the feeds are very expensive now. They can't get enough corn to mix feed and things like that. So what's the corn market now? I just want to know more about that. Well, uh, the, the only reason I mention it is that it's... A, I don't know the detail of the corn market, but all I can tell you is as soon as my friends in the commodity market start to see shortages and problems with crops, then that signals to them an increase. And that's certainly, apparently, as far as we can tell, but my friend says that this is... Actually, my source says this is actually happening in China. So that will, that will increase the price of corn and therefore increase, increase the price of, of foodstuffs generally, if that answers your question. But it's just... It's important to watch these things because you never know the real level until it actually hits the market. But I just would caution it'd be a good thing to watch. Well, could you comment a little bit more about the uh, decision that has been taken with regard to Spain uh, by the United Kingdom? One, uh, there's some contradiction. What the Department for Transport is saying is different from what the uh, Foreign Office is saying. The Department for Transport is saying, look, you're quarantined for 14 days if you've been to Spain. The uh, foreign office, you say, oh, you can go to Canary Islands and uh, Balearic uh, Island and, you know, just take your decision if the travel is non-essential. And then second, what are the implications for travel insurance, particularly with regard to people who are already in uh, Spain and then this announcement uh, just caught them uh, by surprise, creating uncertainty and confusion? Right. First of all, the... the, the, the the view is that you make your own decision about this, and if you can be quarantined for 14 days when you come back from Spain and that doesn't interrupt your business or your social life, then that's completely down to you. I have to say that I, I, I'm, I think that people travelling to other countries in these times of uncertainty are really running the risk of that. And the, the, the problem is that in this country, they've been dealing with the pandemic with very, very large instruments rather than doing it quite surgically. Hence, the whole of Spain. Um, travel insurance is something else. I mean, you, you see the big problem with business uh, interruption insurance. That is going to be a big story. And I think travel insurance also will. I don't think that travel insurance applies if the government says don't travel. 
But if it's up to you whether you travel or not, then that puts a whole different, um, a whole different uh, uh, picture as far as insurance is concerned. But I think we're going to see a lot of claims from people, and I think the travel industry itself is now teetering on the edge of just not existing uh, in, as far as some companies are concerned. That's what the travel companies are saying right now. And as I said earlier in my report, we're also apparently now looking at Germany and France. So it is a very, very confusing picture. My view, for what it's worth, is put a mask on and stay at home and be careful. We do have, and I was, I was talking again to a, 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 a quite a distinguished uh, medical um, commentator over the weekend, and he said, you know, there are there are there are some reasons for optimism about this. I mean, people are vaccine trials. We know about that. We've talked about that before. That's that's going to hurt immunity um, is growing. Apparently, hand washing and hygiene measures are also growing and more more protective equipment is around at the moment. And we do finally know a little bit more about COVID-19 and how to treat. We talked about uh, dexamethasone, dexamethasone, um, didn't we, uh, a couple of weeks ago, which doesn't stop. It's not a vaccine, but it's, it protects people who are actually suffering. So there are some bright spots in all this, but you're absolutely right. The, the, the implementation of, these, of this advice is very clumsy and not very expert. Thank you so much, Michael. I mean, I listened to a government official this morning grant an interview on another network saying she has taken her break, but it will be within London. She's not going anywhere. Thank you. Great to see you. Michael. And for COVID-19 updates all over the world, Aaron Akarajala joins us. Good to see you, Aaron. Good morning. Good morning to you, Adesua. Good morning to you, Doctor. Good, Good morning, morning to you, Good morning, Good morning. Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Doctor, let's get straight into it. I you, you don't have poems for well, this uh, one. Don't worry about allegiance lies. Don't worry about allegiance lies. No pressure, Aaron. Uh, no pressure. Oh, Tell allegiance. All right, get your, your allegiance is lying to Tundu sovereignty, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, looking at Africa, let's start it off from Africa. We have a lot to actually cover on the continent of Africa. Looking at Africa and how coronavirus has been ravaging Africa is quite, is quite devastating, understanding that we have seen the huge rise. Initially, we were talking about the fact that Africa con um, countries in Africa were handling COVID-19 very well. But going back to that particular um, CDC, Africa CDC's um, graph there, you can actually see that over 844,522 of uh, um, patients have actually gone down with COVID-19 with 17,682 deaths. Now, Southern Africa has taken a cake in this. A lot of numbers are coming from that particular region. Of course, South Africa, you can actually see there. South Africa right now, they're the fifth most infected country in the world, by far the highest in Africa. Over 445,433 in South Africa and rising, followed by Egypt, then Nigeria. We can see that Nigeria has also crossed that particular green mark. Now, talking about Nigeria, let's get into Nigeria and try to break it down. Unfortunately, we've seen things also rise in Nigeria, which is, which is kind of fearful. Moving on to the next slide from Nigeria, we'll find out that you can see that, that the breakdown for Nigeria recently, the new cases right now, we have over 40,000, we know that. Lagos State is still accounting. This was for yesterday alone. Lagos State is still accounting for a chunk of what we are getting to see be, still being the epicenter of COVID-19 in Nigeria. New cases, 555. And the, the, the worrying fact is that just 262,579 deaths, I mean, te I mean, tests have been conducted in Nigeria, which is very, very, which is very worrying. Understanding that the government made a pledge that at some point by 28, which will be tomorrow, they would have tested 2 million people and as you see it right now, just over 22% of that 2 million have been tested. So we're not even sure because we are, there are still talks about underreporting when it comes to COVID-19 in Nigeria. And even the, even the Commissioner of Health, Aki Abayomi, even spoke last week and said that with Lagos accounting for well over, if we move on to the next slide, we get to see the breakdown. With Lagos accounting for well over 13,000, going to 14,000, we, we are seeing the rise in the graph at a certain level, with Lagos accounting for over 14,000. That means, based on, based on some graphs and based on some permutation, it is well over 140,000. We know that quite a lot of asymptomatic people are walking around in Lagos. That is why the insistence of wearing any kind of face covering, keeping your social distance, and more importantly, ensuring that every kind of hygiene is being adhered to, to the strictest 
of points is very important. But we are seeing this thing grow and grow exponentially. It's quite frightening. And as a matter of fact, not only that, it's not just ravaging the people. Health workers also in Africa are suffering heavily from COVID-19. And at the moment, WHO has said that um, 10,000 health workers in Africa have gone down with COVID-19. If they can help us blow up that graph, we'll get to break it down concerning how many people in Africa have actually died. This is from um, Amnesty International. We can actually see that Ghana and South Africa has had six deaths. Zimbabwe, one. Mauritius, one. Algeria, seven. Egypt, 111. And those are the number of people that have died from COVID-19. Moving on to the next slide to help us break it down. Even in Nigeria, Nigeria has recorded three deaths from health workers of COVID-19. Ghana has two. Cameroon has two. So it's really sad understanding that the frontline workers who are at more risk of contracting COVID-19 and they are very essential to curbing the spread of this virus are being open and are not being protected. All right, we've spoken about the shortages of PPEs and also remuneration, which is key that the WHO also said is key because they need to be motivated. They are putting their lives on the line. More importantly, they are putting their families on the line because at some point they would have to return to their families and if they are down or they're asymptomatic without knowing it and they go to their families, they become spreaders, which is rather unfortunate about what is happening right now in Africa. And we are hoping things get better. We're hoping that the government puts more spotlight on this. We are seeing them subpedal in regards to COVID-19. We are hoping that testing is being ramped up. South Africa is getting close to 3 million tested done. Morocco has got 1.1 million tested done. Nigeria has been pledged to do 2 million testing, and at the moment, we've just done over 260,000 testing. And if we, if we are having 40,000, then by the time we do mass testing, like we've seen in South Africa, Morocco, Egypt, then the numbers will even be worse than what we're seeing right now. Indeed, and the government officials have not, you know, they're not shying away from the fact that for every case we have been able to catch, there mm -hmm. are many more cases we have uh, left undetected. Mostly, so you can imagine important. what those numbers are like. Uh, I'm particularly worried about the health workers and the WHO report. Um, when you look at the doctor-patient ratio we had even before COVID-19, mm -hmm. and you get to hear that, you know, these numbers of frontline workers which some people now even describe as our last line of defense, the health workers, it is disturbing to know that, you know, increasing numbers of our doctors and medical professionals uh, are coming now with COVID-19. It's something we need to look at. It's something we need to stop uh, very quickly. I think what we need to emphasize is the need to pay more attention to testing. Yeah. Now, the challenge that we face with testing is not just Nigerian. It's across Africa. And that is why, you know, the position... Uh, the received opinion is that, look, in Africa, we probably do not even know the exact figure, you know, from one country to the other. Now, South Africa seems to have the best facility and the best level of commitment to uh, testing. But here in Nigeria, we have improved since March. But a lot more needs to be done. Yes, now is. that we're at 40,000 plus in terms of the positivity rate, now the actual figure may be worse than that. Way worse than that. And I think that, you know, uh, government needs to do a lot more uh, in that direction. And if you compare our recovery rate, discharge rate, to the uh, positivity rate, and now the gap doesn't seem to be quite close, mm -hmm. particularly if you cite the example of, uh, of uh, Morocco. You mentioned Morocco. Yeah. In Morocco, the total figure positivity rate is over 20,000. The recovery rate is about 17,000 plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we also need to do a lot more in terms of uh, treatment. And I have always uh, made the point here that, look, uh, we shouldn't get tired. We shouldn't get fatigued. We are opening up the airports. We are opening up uh, the railways uh, from uh, Wednesday, Abuja to uh, Kaduna route. And we are opening up businesses on a gradual basis. But we shouldn't lose sight of the ball with regard to the challenge of uh, COVID-19. And I hope that the relevant authorities will do what they need to do. All right, I, I just quickly want to squeeze it in. Uh, you talked about testing, but I want to talk more about the protocol of testing. People test, it's still molecular testing. A lot of people have tested, they've not gotten their results till date. The mechanism of putting that across, you know, the NDDC talked about an app recently uh, where people can check the results of their tests. That is not yet still in place. So that's what we should look at, not just testing. 
you know, the protocol of testing. Yeah, because testing uh, and tracing is very yeah, important. Yeah, testing and tracing is important. And, and yes. can, we, can we start to look at other methods of testing apart from this, uh, you know, hardline molecular testing? Because if you want to test more, what's the viability of using molecular testing to well, be able to what, test more? What the authorities say they've adopted is smart testing, yes. as they call it, not rapid uh, testing kits. Yes.